needless intravenous systems, and particularly needless intravenous devices. I want to first provide a little historical view of how we got to use needless systems in the first place, then discuss current guideline recommendations, and then talk about what are the characteristics of needless connectors that you should be looking for that are associated with the lowest risk of infection. If we go way back into the 80s and early 90s, needle stick injuries associated with needles and other sharp objects are a major problem in our healthcare settings. It was estimated by CDC that over 385,000 sharp injuries occurred annually to healthcare workers. Obviously, this raised the risk of blood-borne pathogens, led to tremendous pressure on the government to do something about it. In fact, as we look at the causes of these needle stick injuries, IV tubing needles was one of the most common causes. This led to the path passage in the early 90s of the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, published in December 91, effective in 1992, that all occupational exposure to blood and potentially infectious material was what the, was the focus of this standard. It went through a number of, of iterations, including the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act, which mandated that OSHA revise this standard. And in doing so, one of the clauses in it was when engineering controls will reduce employee exposure either by removing, eliminating, or isolating the hazard, they must be used. So it was no longer healthcare facilities could think about it or discuss it, but they really had to be used. And that led CDC and others to try to eliminate the use of needles as much as possible and where we came with use of needle-free IV delivery systems. It's important to understand the pathophysiology of how bloodstream infections occur in our patients. They really fall into two categories. When you first insert that catheter through the skin, you can pick up organisms that are sitting on the skin they attach to the outside or external surface of the catheter, produce an exopolysaccharide or biofilm, and then lead to infections. And this is the pathogenic mechanism early after catheterization. So in the first, say, five to seven days, the majority of bloodstream infections are secondary to this. And that's why we have the insertion bundle with you know, hand hygiene, use of chlorhexidine, skin prep, maximum bear precautions, et cetera, is really focusing on this. But after that, you manipulate the needleless connector, you manipulate the IV line, you inject medications, you sometimes have stock cocks involved, and when that happens, you get contamination shown by these red dots of the hub or the catheter. It's intraluminal colonization, and it follows the same pathogenic mechanism of sticking to the inside of the catheter, producing an exopolysaccharid or biofilm that protects it from the immune system, protects it from IV antibiotics, and can allow bloodstream infections to occur. And this is thought to be the major source of central line associated bloodstream infections after the first week of catheterization. We also need to remember where do the bugs come from that cause these infections to occur. We'll go in reverse order here. Contaminated infusates, whether they be intrinsic or extrinsic contamination of infusates, in the United States and North America virtually doesn't happen anymore. Intrinsic contamination was last documented in IV fluids in the late 1970s. Extrinsic contamination, that is contamination after manufacture, also rarely occurs now because you're no longer at the bedside adding calcium, potassium, magnesium, et cetera, that we used to do when I trained in the early days of my internship. Now that doesn't happen anymore. So this rarely occurs. Second is contamination of the hub, either through the patient's skin or our skin. And that is thought to account for maybe 20%, 12 to 20% of the bloodstream infections. The most important and most common are skin organisms, the patient's own skin organisms or our skin organisms. If we look at needless connectors, the first generation of needless connectors that were produced were called split septum. They had a very smooth surface with a small septum and a blunt cannula was used to engage the needless connector. Shortly after their introduction, we saw a number of outbreaks 
of bloodstream infections associated with them. One we published by Lisa Danzig found that having a needleless connector, in particular this needleless connector, receipt of parenteral nutrition or lipid emulsion, so having something in the connector that could uh, be a good nutrient for bacteria, and then the frequency of end cap changes. At that time, the end cap was supposed to be changed at every 48 to 72 hours, and in this case, they weren't. And that led to a number of outbreaks after enhanced infection control precautions were implemented in this hospital and in others, those outbreaks literally disappeared. Since that time, we've had virtually a revolution in the introduction and innovation with needless connectors, going from split septum that have negative displacement to lure activated negative displacement, or in some cases, less negative displacement, and then lastly, positive displacement and now even neutral displacement needleless connectors. So a wide variety of needleless connectors. And in the United States, uh, you have a tremendous choice of different needleless connectors. But although these devices seem like they're very easy to use, there are many opportunities for error. These include clinicians not disinfecting the surface of the connector failure to completely flush or to flush per protocol, clamping of the extension tube. If you look at negative versus positive pressure needless connectors, the sequence of clamping and disinfection is the opposite. In many hospitals I go into where they have both negative and positive needless connectors in different areas, say a positive pressure needless connector in the intensive care unit and a negative connector in uh, the wards and home infusion might be using a neutral connector. The clinicians don't know which connector they're using, and that, as a result, they don't get the clamping sequence and disinfection sequence correct. And then re replacing the device per protocol. I remember a colleague calling me about a consultation she was doing in a hospital where they had a tremendous problem, very high bloodstream infection rate, and when she asked them how frequently they were changing the needleless connector, their response was, well, when it doesn't work anymore. Well, no, they're supposed to be changed more frequently than that. And the frequency of these errors is really unknown. We've seen an uh, introduction of a variety of connectors, and we've seen outbreaks associated with a wide variety of connectors. One of the first was by Cassie Salgado at uh, University of South Carolina, where they were in a long-term acute care hospital. They were using a split septum. They changed to a mechanical valve needless connector and their bloodstream infection rate went from about 1.8 to 5.4, literally a tripling of their bloodstream infection rate. This was highly statistically significant. And particularly they saw a five-fold increase from about 8% to 40% of gram-negative bloodstream infections. And after this was detected, they went in and did education, 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 and could not get their bloodstream infection rate to go down and finally had to go back to a split septum needless connector. Subsequently, Mark Rupp at the University of Nebraska. Again, this is an acute care facility. They were using a split septum. They changed to a positive pressure needless connector. And in their ICU, their other inpatient areas, and even in their outpatient therapy, they saw tremendous increases from 3.9 to 10.4, a doubling here, and literally a tripling of bloodstream infection rate. And again, they went in and tried to do education to get that rate down. Using that positive pressure needles connector, it would not succeed. They finally had to go back to a negative or a uh, split septum connector, and when they did, the bloodstream infections decreased again. We did a study involving hospitals in the United States and Australia. And I think this study added several things to the literature. One, it's multi-center. Second, it doesn't involve just one connector. It's multiple connectors. It was negative and positive pressure connectors. And lastly, we asked about infection control practices in the two different time periods. This was at uh, five different hospitals. This is the different infection control practices. Most did not have an IV team. Most were not using impregnated catheters. They weren't using the bio patch. They weren't using a securement device. They weren't using vancomycin prophylaxis. Most of them had stopcocks. They were drawing blood through the connector, which is very important because each time you're drawing blood through that connector, you increase the risk of biofilm development. They were using alcohol for disinfection. And you can see that they, both in terms of disinfection and skin antisepsis, changed to better practices when they were using the mechanical valve, needless connectors, and with split septum. 
They were all using either a split septum or needles, had about one half a year to two years worth of data, then they changed to a variety of negative or positive pressure needless connectors. Again, had about a year to three years worth of data. Uh, and then three of them in the United States were able to switch back to a split septum technology uh, and had about six months to 18 months worth of data. When we look at data from the ICUs and wards, if you see the summary of ICUs here, during the split septum time period, the rate was about six per thousand catheter days. And when they introduced the mechanical valves, it increased to about 9.5 per thousand catheter days. The hospitals that could go back to split septum went back to below baseline levels. So this showed very nicely that as you went from split septum to mechanical valve, the bloodstream infection rate went up despite enhanced infection control practices. And when they went back to split septum, the rate went down again. If we look at characteristics of needless connectors, these are the things you should be thinking about. First is fluid displacement upon either connect or disconnect. Is it negative? Is it a positive or is it neutral? Internal mechanisms, are they simple or are they complex? Are there multiple moving parts or no moving parts? Access to the fluid path, is it through a blunt cannula, lure activated access, split septum access? The internal design, is the fluid path straight or is it indirect? And then priming volume, what is the amount of fluid required to remove the air in that needless connector. And then last, the dead space, which is inside the housing, and it's where fluid from many of the manufacturers will tell you can't get there. And that a number of studies have been done where you've cut that connector and look and you see that fluid actually is getting there. If we look at these different characteristics, again, uh, characteristics, again access type can be split septum or lure activated access. Visibility, it can be clear or opaque. If you look at the INS standard, it says if the integrity of the injection or access cap is compromised, or if residual blood remains within the cap, it should be replaced immediately, or consideration should be given to changing the catheter and administration set. And then you have connector external surface. That external surface can be relatively flat, in which case it's pretty easy to disinfect, or it can be very complicated where it's more difficult to disinfect. Again, fluid displacement can be negative, positive, or neutral. Theoretically, at least, neutral decreases the risk of occlusion. Positive pressure also is supposed to decrease the risk of occlusion. Negative pressure is when you disconnect, the blood comes back into the catheter and theoretically can increase occlusion. However, there are very few data, very few published data on the impact of either neutral or positive pressure connectors on actually decreasing occlusions and decreasing infections. Internal mechanisms, you can either have a simple, such as uh, the blunt cannula attaching to the administration set. A second design eliminates that blunt, blunt cannula because some have used needles, even though you're not supposed to use needles with them, and allows a male lure end of an administration set or syringe to be inserted. And then you can have complex, which can have any variety of internal mechanisms, often called mechanical valves. And that device controls the flow of fluid within the device. Access to the fluid path. If you have external blunt cannula or lure access, the blunt cannula is pushed through the septum. It can either manually be held in place during injection or have some time of locking mechanism to prevent accidental disconnection. Devices that use a lower access mechanism can include both mechanical valve or split septum groups. And you'll see some connectors are called reverse split septum. In terms of internal design with both types of split septum device, the pathway of fluid through the device is straight because there's no internal mechanisms. Mechanical valves can have a variety of internal designs. Fluid must flow either through or around these moving parts. If it's through, it's usually straight. If it's around, it's usually not straight. And then internal volume is the amount of fluid required to remove the air from the internal device. And that's off, often called dead space as well. So in terms of internal mechanism, we can have mechanical valve. We can have split septum with internal blunt cannula. You can have split septum with no internal mechanisms or pressure sensitive valves. 
Some uh, needless connectors have internal springs. And then some have mic microbial barriers, either interluminal or extraluminal. Some use silver, some use chlorhexidine with, with silver. Some are impregnated or some are coated or sprayed. There have been a couple of studies looking at microbial barriers, particularly the silver, particularly the silver impregnated needless connectors. And in, in one study, all they did was put uh, bacteria into it, let it sit for 24 to 36 hours, then flushed it and, and collected it and cultured it, and that showed that all of the bugs were killed. The problem with that study is that's not how you use needless connectors. You pull blood back into that connector. So we did a study where we did exactly what uh, Dr. Mackey had done in his study, but the difference was we took bovine blood, put it in the connector, flushed it out, put it in the connector, flushed it out, didn't leave it in for any length of time at all, and then put those same types of bugs into the connector, and we found it wasn't getting killed at all because there was biofilm development between the silver and uh, the bugs. Actuations are the number of times you use that device, and many of the uh, if not all of the needless connector companies have done studies to see how many times you can activate that device before you start seeing degradation. If we look at split septum, this is just an example of one split septum. One of the unique characteristics of the United States is there's a smaller number of split septum and a larger number of mechanical valves. If you go to a country like Japan, it's just the opposite. So these connectors vary from one part of the world to the next. Some are clear like this and some are opaque. If we look at the external surface, it's, that external surface is very, very important for a couple of reasons. One is, is it easy to disinfect or does it have a lot of cracks and crannies that make it difficult to disinfect? And second is, what about the gap? Is there a gap between the septum and the housing? Because if there is a gap, then contamination can get into that gap and get into the connector. If we look at mechanical valves, this is just a, a uh, schematic showing that as you uh, activate this device, that fluid then goes around the internal mechanisms of this device. Others activate in a different way. So knowing how your connector is activated and what the fluid path is, direct or indirect, is very important. The fluid path is important because if it's direct, you probably have less surface area for biofilm to develop, to develop on, whereas if it's indirect, you probably have more surface area for that biofilm to develop on. One of the issues that came up after these outbreaks occurred was why? Why are these occurring? What is the mechanism? So Toby Karchmer, who was at Wake Forest University at that time, decided to do a study, and they did quantitative blood cultures from ICU patients through the, the mechanical valve needless connector that they were using. So they went to their, they had seven ICUs. They went to the ICU first thing in the morning, and they took 10 cc's of draw from each needless connector with each patient, sent it down to the lab to be cultured. So they had 226 of what they called discards from 83 patients, and of those, 17% of them were positive. I mentioned that there were seven ICUs. The lowest rate was 8%, but in one ICU, 50% of them were culture positive. They had small numbers of organisms, but up to 100. And pathogens were primarily coagulase negative staphylococci, but they had yeast, staph aureus, serratia, enterococcus, sternotrophomonas, multifilia, and even acinetobacter. So some of these would be considered contaminants, but many of them would be considered pathogens. They then, after they got these results, they went back to the ICU nursing personnel and said, how often do you manipulate that needless connector and you don't bother to disinfect it? And we're shocked that the nurses acknowledged 31% of the time. Now, they're acknowledging something they're not supposed to do, so it probably was even higher than this. But 31% of the time, they were not disinfecting that connector. So there's been two studies published in the literature on disinfection of connectors. This one by Menehe and Mackey, published in Itchy in 2006, where they took three lure-activated connectors and they inoculated them in Intercoccus faecalis, about 10 to the 8th colony-forming unit. So they dipped them in Intercoccus faecalis, 10 to the 8th, and then they set and let them dry for about 24 hours. And then they did one of three things. No disinfection, took a syringe, hooked it to the connector, pushed the fluid through, broth through, and cultured it on the other side. 
Second, they took uh, alcohol swab and did three to five seconds of what they f said was vigorous wipe of the connector, then connected a syringe with broth and shot it through. And the third was use of a chlorhexidine impregnated cap that at the time there were no caps, alcohol or chlorhexidine at the time. Uh, and they used that, took it off, and then attached a syringe with broth. These are the results. Not surprisingly, if you do no disinfection, 100% of them are culture positive with up to 28,000 colony forming units per ml. So those 31% of nurses that weren't doing any decontamination, obviously there's great risk to those patients. This was rather surprising if they were using 70% alcohol, three to five seconds, still 67% of them were positive. Go look at your colleagues. Many times what I see is here's the needless connector, here's the alcohol, boom maybe one second, maybe two at the most. Not gonna be effective. Up to 25,000 colony forming units. And the third, with this chlorhexidine cap, only one was positive in relatively low levels of organisms. So this study showed that if you don't disinfect, you've got a problem, and even if you disinfect for three to five seconds with alcohol, you may not be disinfecting adequately. Subsequently, Wendy Kaler and colleagues did another study. They used a wider variety of connectors. They used a lower inoculum, so 10 to the fifth. So the final inoculum was about 10 to the two or 10 to the three. So perhaps a little bit more clinically relevant. And they used a wider variety of organisms, Staph epidermidis, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas originonis, and Candida albicans. And what they did was they did a 15 second friction rub with either 70% alcohol or chlorhexidine with alcohol and found if you did either one of those, it was perfectly fine. It was adequately disinfected. This is just a, a visual illustration of the issue that we're dealing with here. This is a, a needless connector and we put a, a glow germ on it and then after swabbing you can see that it's still fluorescent dye there and in fact if you then connect a syringe you see the fluorescent dye is transferred to that syringe. So if you have contamination and you haven't adequately disinfected that connector, you're going to transmit those pathogens. This is a electron micrograph showing the external surface of one of these connectors and you can see large numbers of bacteria illustrated by electron microscopy. So if we look at features that increase the risk of a bloodstream infection, first is difficult cleaning access because then the healthcare workers are not gonna adequately disinfect that surface and it's gonna to lead to fluid path contamination. Second is gaps around the plunger because that can harbor bacteria and you cannot get into that area when you're trying to disinfect. Opaque housing can hide incomplete flushing of media, particularly if you have blood, TPN, lipid emulsion and then internal mechanisms that obscure the fluid path. So it's impossible to visually see and confirm whether you've adequately flushed or not. If we look at this uh, with pictures, you can see here a very flat surface that would be fairly easy to disinfect, whereas this one has all sorts of little gaps, much more difficult. You can't get into those little cracks and crannies. Gap around the plunger, you can see this one here has a, a surface septum that goes right up to the housing, whereas this one here, you hopefully can see there's a little gap. Bacteria can get into that gap and you cannot disinfect it. Opaque housing, clear versus opaque housing. Internal mechanisms that obscure the fluid path. So in this case, the fluid path is coming around and if you have a device like this, you really can't see the fluid path and you can't see whether you just, you've uh, cleared it when you've flushed. So let's look, look at the last, latest recommendations. We really have them from two different organizations. One is the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, or SHEA. They published their recommendations in 2008. And their recommendations were to do not routinely use positive pressure needles connectors with mechanical valves before a thorough assessment of risk, benefits, and education regarding the proper use. They furthermore said routine use of the currently marketed devices that are associated with the increased risk of center line associated bloodstream infections or CLABSI is not recommended. Subsequent to that, CDC published their IV guideline. In that IV guideline, they had four recommendations for needless connectors. I'm not gonna go into the first three because they were the same 
as the 2002 guideline. The only change was when needless systems are used, the split septum valve is preferred over a mechanical valve due to increased risk of infection with some mechanical valves. So if we look at what are the desirable characteristics of needless character, first is to have a flu flat, smooth, easy to disinfect external surface. Second is to have no opening or gap around the septum seal where it has con the septum connects to the housing. Third is clear housing. Fourth is least complex internal mechanism. Fifth is having a straight fluid path. Sixth is minimum dead space. Seventh would be having no requirement for a clamping sequence, either clamp and disinfect or disinfect and clamp so that clinicians aren't confused. Next is having no blood reflux, and last is being able to flush with saline. The reason being, if you're flushing with heparin, as you know, heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, or HIT, is an issue that we deal with with our patients, so if we can avoid use of heparin by use of saline, uh, it would be beneficial. So in conclusion, needless connectors initially were introduced to protect all of us. They were introduced to protect the healthcare workers from needle stick injuries and bloodborne pathogens. And only secondarily did manufacturers concentrate on trying to reduce the risk of complications in patients. We've seen central line associated bloodstream infection outbreaks associated with needless connectors, and they illustrate the potential adverse event of connectors on patients. We've seen now several generations of needless connectors with different denials, from the very early split septum connectors to negative, positive, neutral mechanical valves and reverse split septum. New needless connectors can continue to be introduced. We really need further studies to evaluate the association of different needless connectors. There was just a paper published on one uh, needless connector just last month but in general, there have been very few papers published on these connectors. So if you either have a positive or a negative experience with a needless connector, I would encourage you to write up your experience and publish it. Needless connectors are an integral part of the center line associated bloodstream infection prevention, insertion, and maintenance bundles, and probably are one of the critical components of prevention of center line associated bloodstream infections that's got the least attention and yet is probably one of the more important. Needless connectors with the best designs improve patient safety and should be the connectors that we use.